Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. Um, my name is Stephen Peinecke, your host, and I'm very much honored to uh, bring this guest on. Uh, I've been very familiar with John and the work that he does for many, many years via uh, Rick Bennett's Gospel Tangents and John DeLynn's Mormon Stories. And so um, I felt like I've known uh, John for many years. And of course, we just talked for the first time the other day and had a, a nice, wonderful conversation to get to know each other. And uh, John, I just want to welcome you to our program. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having me. This is an interesting exploration that you're doing because uh, there's not a lot of a lot of times where evangelicals are very interested in the restoration in a open, positive sense, at least, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's wonderful. It, yeah. And, and, and uh, so I really and actually it's it, I didn't realize that like some of my views uh, theologically were kind of shaped by you via our conversation when I was telling you kind of a viewpoint that I've kind of evolved to and realized, oh, well, that's something. And then it dawned on me, oh, yeah, you know, you're more than I, I loved your history. Like a, you get a real detailed a history about the restoration. And I find it very fascinating. But obviously, some of your theological views kind of through osmosis or somehow made it into my worldview. <laughs> So you kind of played a pastoral role, which I didn't realize <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, but um, oh. um, I, I just think it's really cool. You know, when I first started encountering uh, uh, the restoration, it was via through the community of Christ. And let me explain to my audience, you know, if, if you're an evangelical or a Protestant, and you want to know what is community of Christ? Well, first of all, it used to be called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And these were the uh, Mormons that decided not to follow Brigham Young. And this would include... Um, Joseph Smith's uh, widow, Emma, Emma, and her family. So they stayed back. And, and around 1860, on April 6th, Joseph Smith III became the prophet uh, of the reorganized church. And then around the year 2000, the church decided to kind of rebrand itself and call itself Community of Christ. Now, I say the best analogy of this is that I would say if you're going to try to kind of find like an evangelical or Protestant equivalent, it would be kind of like liberal Methodist, you know, type, I, you could almost say. <laughs> Um, so I encounter the, the community of Christ and uh, all these people say, you got to talk to John Hamer. You got to talk to John. Oh, I love John Hamer. <laughs> and for many people, I've realized that many community of Christ people, especially since the start of this mini apocalypse that we're in, um, have you've become kind of their pastor worldwide because a lot of people have been watching your center place uh, congregation on uh, online. So uh, yeah. before we get into your background, tell me just what's that, what was that like to be kind of a, uh, to rethink what church is and how that works and, and how has been that adventure for you? So, yeah, um, I'm serve as the pastor of the downtown congregation. I'm actually here in the building center place, Toronto center place, which is um, it's a new facility, but it's a very old congregation. The congregation was first organized in 1836 and uh, John Taylor was the very first pastor. Mm. Um, it fell into disorganization a couple times, which, by which we say, and that's what we mean in the reorganized tradition, which is to say, um, in the restoration, we made a very big point in saying, you know, Joseph Smith is not the founder of any church. Christ is the founder of the church, and it merely falls into a state of disorganization, and then it is reorganized, right? And so that's the that's the premise and why we even use this weird uh, bureaucratic word reorganized. <laughs> and so, um, and so that happened here too, which is to say, um, at certain points, the, um, the leaders of the congregation will get called to the, 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 the uh, denominational center place. So John Taylor kind of famously goes off and becomes an apostle and later uh, is part of Brigham Young's movement and becomes Brigham Young's successor out in, in Utah. Uh, but likewise, the leader of the, um, the second organization of the congr congregation here ended up being an apostle in, in independence and get, got called away to independence. And so then the church stops meeting. There's continuity of members uh, through the whole time, but they're not meeting every week. And so it's since 1891 that this congregation has been meeting. Um, and then for the last five years, actually, uh, one of the things that we've had as a, a major um, initiative and outreach goal is uh, is an online congregation. So how can we start to do church online? How can we um, um, share what the congregation's um, uh, understanding of being calling of being a community of Christ in the world is with people and try to build community online? Um, that as of two years ago, we 
integrated the online congregation with our own local Sunday congregation here. And so as a result of that, when the pandemic hit, we had a kind of a, a system that was more um, at, adapted to being able to you know go to online services because actually lots of the people on our sermon roster were not living physically in Toronto to begin with. And so as a result, we already had sort of a hybrid service. And so we went by going to fully, um, fully online, which we did in March of uh, 2020, um, we were able to ramp up and significantly um, faster than almost any other uh, community of Christ congregation. And so by Easter, we had uh, more than a thousand people joining us live in real time. Uh, ultimately, we've had engagement from people in over 90 different countries. Um, our, our Sunday service is uh, translated into the church's three core languages. So English, Spanish, and French. And, uh, you know, the majority of the people, the largest number of the people come from the United States because it is a North American based denomination. And at least um, in terms of the members who are able to get online and things like that, that's where the larger percentage of them are going to be. But we've been really happy that uh, that by far a consistent third place uh, uh, position has been held by French Polynesia, which is one of the reorganized churches uh, um, generational zones there are there's islands in in the near tahiti where people are ethnically community of christ <laughs> you know so there's that's only a few places in the world where that's true and uh and so their primary um language that they interact with everybody is in french and so um so we've had sermons uh preached in french from tahiti uh in our congregation and so it's been really wonderful to be able to interact with um uh, people in for example, heritage centers of the church, and then just also pe other people who have uh, come into the tradition, uh, you know, from wherever they are in the world. So yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, one of my earlier interactions was with a gentleman who uh, is in charge of the uh, Community of Christ subreddit, and he oh, yeah. go and he lives on a boat in San Francisco Bay with his wife and his dog. And he's, right. and you're his pastor. He says that he's my pastor. <laughs> so you just got to run into these unique individuals and, um, and, and, and the community of Christ subreddit. It's been really wonderful. The community of Christ has been so loving and embracing to me. Um, and, and, and also the, I'm friends with the, uh, with people who are uh, hold positions of authority in the uh, independent restoration branches and have yeah. engagement with them as well. And they even said, oh, you're going to you're going to talk to John Hamer. That's great. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, these are people like they left because of people like you on one sense. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. They, no, that's nice. I'm happy to hear that. So they were very positive, which I thought was really cool. You know, I find that the, the break off between the independent branches and the uh, uh, um, community of Christ isn't as acrimonious as I've seen on our side. So I thought at least there is some overlap. You know, like Barbara Walden uh, recommended to me, well, contact this person who's I, I'm on the phone with him for five minutes. And well, this is an independent guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But it is fascinating to see that, that, uh, that, that dynamic within the, within your community. Well, I'm happy that it's been that that part that that's been bit getting better, right? And so I would say that um, because it's the most recent division, you know, since that's only it, it, it's only go dates back to the 1980s now, um, it's been more raw, you know, for folks. And and so even for example, I organized when I was the director of the John Whitmer Historical Association, like around 2007 or so, we organized a conference, a J, regular JWHA conference, but we invited about 12 different like leaders from the different um, restoration tradition churches and got, I think, together the largest number that had ever been assembled. Uh, and and the toughest ones were some of the folks from the, the restorationists, the independent uh, branch tradition, because they were maybe um, more concerned about our motives, <laughs> you know, than, than some of the others. Who, you know, when you're when you're out of when you're out of um, communion with people since 1844. It's not as harsh usually in terms of, I mean, the people in the Church of Jesus Christ, um, I've just been fast friends with every time I've ever interacted with any of those folks. And I just think they have the, um, they've got the best little Mormon church. They don't, they don't use the word Mormon, but anyway, we're there, the, the little rock that has been carved without hands and is rolling forth and is going to do all of, you know, like it's all the work of the, of the world is on their shoulders and they're doing it. And uh, and they are very um, aware of the gifts of the spirits and in their presence and doing all of the things that they're doing. And they've been um, really fun to 
uh, they're the most isolated of the branches, right? Because either you're either you're kind of camped out around Salt Lake and you and you have a um, you're influenced by the Big Mormon Church, or you're kind of camped out around Independence and you can't help but be influenced by Community of Christ. These guys are off in Pennsylvania doing their own thing, <laughs> and, and so they're lots of fun. Oh yeah, I'll tell you, my very first encounter with the Restoration was a couple Sundays ago, where I attended a Church of Jesus Christ uh, service and I felt at home. They yeah. were wonderful people. And like I tell, like I've been telling all my evangelical friends, they love Jesus, they love the Bible, and they love the Book of Mormon. And I yep. felt at home with them. And God bless them. I love them. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is really fascinating. I, I uh, because the community of Christ is a different angle, and I'm glad that's where I that's an area where I felt most comfortable. That's most accessible for somebody from a Protestant evangelical background is to navigate in those waters first, and then. I started engaging with the LDS. And so that, that's another fascinating aspect as well. And, and that's actually where you got your start. Right. Because you were born, well, we, uh, I guess you were probably born in the covenant and uh, you're right. from an LDS uh, family. And right. so just let's talk a little bit about growing up LDS and, and a little bit of your background and your childhood and growing up. Right, yeah. So um, I was born into the, like you say, into the LDS church uh, and, uh, in the Midwest. So I was called what uh, people would call back then a mission field Mormon as opposed to a Utah Mormon. And um, from my mom's line, uh, my dad was a convert to uh, the church and um, subsequently has left and, and actually is converted to evangelical Christianity. Uh, but my mom uh, uh, is sixth generation, I'm seventh generation on her line going back uh, to the uh, you know the early church tradition when um, our earliest ancestors joined uh, in, in Kirtland in the winter of 1832-1833. So in other words, back close to the beginning, not all the way. Uh, and it's a less so. A lot of times, people in Utah share all the same ancestors because they were polygamous, and so it's 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 less rare to be descended from Brigham Young than you'd think. You know, because of that, it's like everybody's descended in Asia of Genghis Khan, right? And so, um, uh, but our our family. Um, was less polygamous. <laughs> and so anyway, so there's fewer people that are on our particular line, which comes down from the, uh, in that particular case, I'm drawing from the Winchester. Uh, there's a Winchester Street in Salt Lake um, that's named for these guys, but there's they're less known. Okay, okay. so that's a little bit of your background. And then, um, so I, I'm just assuming you have a typical, uh, it's, it's atypical in that you're not in Utah, but typical in the sense that you're born and raised in the Mormon household. You get baptized when you're eight, I'm assuming. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I got baptized when I was eight. Um, in general, we were a, uh, like a kind of a central ch church family in our ward. Um, my, uh, my, my mom would frequently be relief society president or, or primary president or those kind of things. Uh, and I was, uh, 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 my dad was the scouting leader. So he was less committed to, you know, he was not, he wouldn't be in the bishoprics and things like that. Um, but uh, in any event, so we did scouting. And so I did all of the kind of um, things that uh, Mormon youth did. So I was the kid who uh, the leaders would call on to say the prayers because uh, they could be, trust me to say a good prayer. <laughs> you know? so, uh, but, you know, then I was like the, you know, when the deacons quorum president and, you know, Eagle Scout at 13 and, and uh, leader of the priest quorum and so on, you know, seminary president, that kind of thing. So I was uh, definitely in the you know, kind of committed camp as a, as a teenage Mormon. Okay. So you basically, you're, okay. And then I just, I want to go back a little bit, but I just want to ask, did you serve a mission? No. Okay. No. So we can, we can just explore that so as the, well then. So yeah. So, so, what, so the, the transition moment comes when I turn 18. So at 18, um, um, I was, I'd already become a doubting teenager. And by the time when I was 18, uh, I ceased to live in the Midwest where Mormons are, I could kind of convince myself that Mormons are kind of like a model minority, like being Jewish or something like that. And, and instead I went and found where, uh, which I'm sure people who are Jewish find when they go live in Israel. But anyway, <laughs> so when I went and lived in, uh, in Provo, I kind of um, decided, oh, well, this is not, people are not living any different here than, than anywhere else. In other words, the same kind of petty um, high school drama, you know, it takes place here in the dorms. And, and so this is not, um, I, like a holy people that I've, you know, been kind of like a part of, but away from. Uh, and so, and that was kind of like the last kind of vestiges for me because I was kind of interested at that point in it, maybe culturally. 
um, uh, and not less so in terms of the various truth claims. And so then at that point, then I decided I'm not going to be involved. And, uh, and so uh, I continued to, you know, nominally be a part of it because you have to while you're a student at BYU. Uh, but then when I graduated, that was the end. So I just this so I want to backtrack a little bit to before you had made this decision at the age of 18. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about what did, did, did your did your sexuality play a role in, in this aspect of you kind of having doubts um, like you're taught one thing about a thing and but then you realize things are different actually being gay. I mean, what yeah. at what age were, did you realize you were gay and then how did that impact and influence your, your growth? Yeah, um, I mean, short answer, no. Uh, but the uh, longer answer is um, back. I'm old now, <laughs> so as a as a person who's in his fifties, um, you know, I grew up in a in a time when uh, the, you know being gay and and being out and having uh, gay role models on television was much much rarer. There was apparently all kinds of different mentions if you were aware of, in the know in, in 1980s television and everything like that, that I completely was oblivious to. And so I never got to see any of that. And so, um, um, my, frankly, for myself as a, a young person who knew, you know, who I was attracted to, but did not put any label on it because being gay is simply um, a boogeyman kind of thing in the, in the culture. Um, I was classically trained, and so my my examples were David and Jonathan from the Bible. You know, so in other words, the idea that uh, these these best friends um, had a greater love than could be had between like married couples because of uh, just that's the theme <laughs> anyway. And so I use that to kind of process that. And so so that's how I kind of um, had my sexuality processed on a shelf and didn't didn't worry about it at all until. Um, much later, years after I uh, had decided I wasn't going to be involved in Mormonism. So years after that, when I met a gay person for the first time, okay, that's when I, I said, oh, okay, now I get it. You know, this, this, this makes all the sense in the world. And so I processed that within about a week of meeting uh, a gay person for the first time when I was 21 in Salt Lake. Um, but no, for, for the, uh, in terms of just involvement and interest in the church, I, um, uh, the things that I was especially uh, didn't like was uh, the sexism, the the racism, uh, and uh, kind of the kind of various faith claims. So I didn't um, buy into uh, the way that spiritual people uh, in the in the congregation in the ward were identifying uh, that they were moved by the spirit in this and that way because I felt that they couldn't discern. Um, my dark doubting heart as a teenager when they thought when I was giving those nice prayers and those nice talks from the pulpit and they would be, oh, you're so spiritual and all those kind of things. And they didn't know that during the entire time I was like, I don't, I mean, I'm grousing because why am I called on for these things when I don't, I don't I'm the one that doesn't believe all this and these, um, you know, naive uh, teenagers <laughs> that, are, that I know who were very sincere but couldn't talk to save, you know, <laughs> you know, their souls or whatever. Um, uh, why weren't they being, you know, recognized in that way? In other words, the discernment here is completely not working according to the way it's advertised. And, and then just uh, things like um, uh, the kind of truth claims, like the Book of Mormon wasn't, was not a clearly not an ancient document. Uh, and also um, things like the Book of Abraham uh, clearly is, was not, uh, informed by actual ancient Egyptian history. And so as a, a teenager who was interested in ancient history and who studied it a lot, um, uh, I was definitely, uh, didn't have it. There was no exposure to independent uh, media that was about Mormonism. So I just uh, did through my own study of scriptures. I could read the book of Genesis and see this is an ancient document. There are weird things going on here that nobody would write this in the 19th century because there's just too much craziness in this document. And the Book of Mormon doesn't fall into that same category. And certainly the Book of uh, Abraham with its various um, facsimiles um, is unaware of actual ancient history, ancient Egyptian history that I was aware of as a as a 16 year old. But of course, I'm living in an era after people know about ancient Egyptian history, as opposed to the 1830s, when it was um, largely, largely fancifully uh, cons constructed or misconstructed. So were you, ex you weren't exposed then to any what would be called 
anti-Mormon literature? No. Or, okay, so that's really interesting. So basically, just on your own, studying the texts themselves. Yes. That you kind of read yourself out of conventional Mormonism just by studying the text, you would, you would say, right? Right. Yes. That's, that's very interesting for, to be 16 years old and kind of be able to an, uh, do an analysis like that. Um, and then what, at the time when you were 16, what, what did you think of the Bible? Um, well, I mean, I guess I, I, I could tell it was an, an ancient book. Um, I don't know exactly what, where, I guess I was, uh, I, uh, dubious of the, I guess dubious of the, the literary, um, claims for supernatural stuff going on in it. Uh, I was probably engaging in what's been a, um, tradition since the invention of history, since Herodotus and Thucydides, um, what historians have routinely done when they go back to mythological works like the Bible is they they start saying, well, what's probably the real story under here, you know? And so they um, they create kind of a, a secular uh, version of it. And that's probably how I was um, approaching the text by at a certain point, I don't, I can't, I can't say, cause it's very hard in retrospect to look back and say, well, what, did, what were you really thinking when you were 17? I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, it's a, I look back at those memories and every time you look back at them, your memory changes because of, and you're, you know, you're reflecting from where you are now. And so I don't know. You know. Uh, okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, no, that's true. That's a very good, very good point. But it, it is fascinating because when I was probably around that age, I was very deeply like into it all being true and and everything like that so i was like hardcore right-wing evangelical yeah. um and I, the thought of even looking at it any differently than uh, than that I, I i'm just fascinated to be your brain your your young brain at that time was really uh, firing off all pistons at that point and i find that very interesting so um so we're so basically so you're 18 and you get to byu and you're looking around and you realize uh, these these are not a chosen or a peculiar people, maybe <laughs> peculiar, but they're not the, the kind of people I expected. So you right. kind of have this whole thing uh, where you're reassessing everything. And now, of course, it looks like you had already kind of te textually analyzed the scriptures. And so culturally, you were thinking away, but then that you kind of were unmoored from uh, from Mormonism a little bit because you had kind of detached yourself from the scriptures. So then culturally, you, uh, you encounter uh, BYU and Provo and um, first of all, what did you take it in school there? And, uh, you know, what was it like just being a, a student in, at, in, in BYU? Yeah, well, so it was like, I got there and a week later, I, I think I, I wrote, I just decided, okay, I'm done with this. <laughs> so it's, it was fairly, it was fairly fast. Um, and then what was it like? I mean, it was, a uh, it's, um, I, I spent the time, uh, attempting to have as little uh, connection to and anything to do with Mormonism as possible during the whole time. And that was a thing that was still more possible, I think, than, than today. Um, so BYU, uh, in the 1960s, they had been very much focused on, I think, making it a, a like what might say, a real university, as opposed to um, in more modern times, uh, uh, there has been this attempts or this ideas that there can be um, uh, partisan institutions that uh, are trying to be equivalent to like Liberty University or something like that are trying to be equivalent of what I call real universities. Um, and and Brigham Young University has moved down that path, I think, very significantly, which um, makes it less um, universal in its in its actual, I don't know, like background as a university. Anyway, so it was still relatively possible then. And so um, I would, uh, I mean, I, I studied history. Uh, I got a, uh, it was my, my, um, uh, major anyway, it was a history major and, and I was involved in all kinds of extracurriculars, including, um, the, uh, I've always been interested in publishing. So, uh, I was the production director and ultimately the publisher of the student review, which is an independent, uh, student published, uh, newspaper. So it's an off campus newspaper that was funded by advertising and things like that. Uh, I was also though the, uh, production director for. Uh, the business school newspaper, the um, honors department journal, the history department journal. So I was doing those kind of things because I was interested in publishing. So, um, and then just, I'm just going to tie things in a little bit back. So 
you, boy, it's interesting. You, you're able to disconnect yourself from Mormonism while at BYU. That's a fascinating thing <laughs> to do as best you yeah. can. And it, that's I was, so I was interested in history, but but specifically because I found Mormon history to be so utterly unendingly boring because I only had access to Mormon church produced materials, which are, um, you know, they start with Wonder Bread and then they run it through the deflavorizer about five or 10 times and they hand it to you and it's just so um, soulless. <laughs> Uh, and, and so anyway, so I, I just I just assumed, OK, I'm just not interested in in recent history at all. And so I became a medievalist and studied medieval and ancient history. And so I, I spent the time just not paying any attention to anything about Mormonism. So I, I learned nothing about Mormon history at BYU. So I was not studying. I mean, so my my study and things like that about Mormon history is dates much later. I started to study Mormon history around 97. Um, so in other words, five years after I left BYU. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So, um, okay. So just a few things. You're in your early twenties. Uh, you, you graduate from BYU. You recognize at around the age of 21 that, oh, okay, I'm gay. And this is right. who I am. This is my identity. And, uh, so just detail this period of time where basically you are, you're, you're out of school and you are starting to just live your life and you are basically completely out out of it out of mormonism yeah. just it's not a, it's not even part of your life it might be just background noise if at this point in your life and and just kind of detail that period of time so um so while i was at byu um uh, during the persian gulf war uh i was going to spend a year as a, a, a research assistant undergrad research assistant at the byu jerusalem center and so I was, had, was about to have, you know, a semester or maybe a year abroad. Uh, and, um, and so I'd flown to Europe and I was doing a kind of a um, Euro rail pass kind of thing, travel around Europe. And then uh, on, our, my, on my way, uh, the BYU students all had flown to Istanbul and they had gotten there that far. And then the Persian Gulf War broke out and Saddam Hussein is firing Scud missiles at Jerusalem. And so at a certain point, they decided to cancel the semester. And so I just was hanging around in Europe for a while. But in any event, while I went to Europe, um, uh, I decided to do this thing that you can always do. I think you can only do when you're that age. <laughs> which is take on, you know, your mind is flexible and your ability to act and all this kind of thing. And so I took on like an entirely different persona. And so as I was going on um, like a year rail pass, uh, I just did not tell anybody who I encountered this entire trip that I had any Mormon background or anything about, you know, what I was doing or BYU or anything like that, right? Um, actually, by the end of the trip, when I was in England, um, I had affected a German accent and people thought I was from Germany, so, you know, but anyway, which was just fun because they didn't believe I was American anyway, because I was very skinny back then. And, you know, so I was, you know, here's this blonde six, four, super skinny guy. And I could barely understand when, you know, what some of them were talking because it's old people in, in Northern England. And they were much happier to think I was German and really good at English than if I was not understanding them otherwise. So anyway, so I let them, you know, believe that. So anyway, so I enjoyed myself so very much having completely left the baggage of this identity behind um, that when I uh, went to graduate school, so I was never really out of school. So I went directly from BYU to graduate school in, in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And so I, again, just purged that from my, my own history and didn't have it be part of it. Interesting. That is really interesting. Going and doing that in Europe—that's fascinating to me. So, your—I uh, I guess I, I want to now let's talk about your reengagement. So, I guess yeah. part of your journey back was you actually uh, reencountered Joseph Smith through the classic book "No Man Knows My History" by Fawn Brody. So, maybe yep. talk a little bit about that reentry point. So yeah, so all through living in in Michigan, uh, uh, I was able to date all these guys who I didn't have Mormonism as part of my backstory or anything because I'm uh, living in a different town in a different state and so on. Uh, however, when um, when I met uh, my now current husband Mike Karpowitz in 1997, where I was actually on a trip to Minnesota and doing some uh, work, my mother. Um, I uh, was a partner in a, uh, a museum um, curation uh, 
uh, company. And so I uh, was designing graphic panels and maps for various history museums. And so I was there to do some a job. Uh, and I was planning on moving to uh, California at that point. And so I met uh, Mike there. And when I met him, uh, because suddenly he's meeting my parents, <laughs> I didn't have the same kind of kind of like, oh, not, you know, I had to kind of explain about Mormonism, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, right from the start, which I had never had to do before. Okay. Uh, and so and so then, you know, he's curious and he likes history and he's interested in some of the same things that I'm interested in and then lots more things, too. And so he asked me a bunch of Mormon history stuff and, you know, and, and he kind of exhausted the kind of uh, what a 16 year old, you know, kind of had learned and studied or whatever pretty fast for me. So I didn't have a huge deep uh, uh, reservoir of what all this Mormon stuff was about. And so, yeah, so I, uh, in terms of um, No Man Knows My History, my mom had that on her bookshelf. And so I um, got it down. It's very readable. I read it pretty fast. And that uh, was the thing that taught me wait a second, Mormon history isn't insanely boring. It's actually kind of crazy interesting. <laughs> and so and so that kind of just led me into, you know, reading all of the big classics of the new Mormon history. So, you know, I, I went down that rabbit hole, I read 40, 50 books or whatever, and then suddenly I knew a lot about Mormon history. <laughs> so, Well, that is so interesting because, you know, that's when you were referring earlier about how milquetoast uh, Mormon history was to you growing up. Now, of course, I being an evangelical, I'm exposed to you guys via, for small hotel Marriott, looking through the Book of Mormon and seeing these Arnold Freiburg paintings and like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then, yeah. and then um, uh, our local Chicago Christian television station, one of the largest ones in the country, aired the Godmakers on television. Okay. And yeah. so as a young child, I was actually exposed to the Godmakers cartoon. So that's yeah. my introduction to the to Mormonism. So to me, it's like, this is really kind of cool, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and I actually watched Battlestar Galactica reruns when I was a young kid and realized that that was heavily influenced by Mormonism as well. And yeah. uh, so uh, so my my entry point is much more like dynamic and interesting and weird and kind of fun. So once I started delving into Mormonism, I just found it endlessly fascinating but then it's just interesting to me as an outsider i'm like wow this is really cool and then you your entry point was through fawn brody which is a fantastic entry point you know if you want yeah. to kind of get to know and and in some of her historicity or the way she writes is a little dated she uses a lot of freudian stuff and all that kind of stuff but generally speaking the book still stands up very well um yep. and one last thing i just have to say uh, when I saw you are a map maker and you re referenced that, I just have to tell you that when I was a little kid, one of the favorite things I used to love to do was I would have a map on one side and I would freehand draw the contours of the maps and I could get it very close. So I, I don't know. I had that little love of map making as a child. So that resonated with me. <laughs> but um, yeah. so uh, so your 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 future husband kind of help, helps you get reengaged into uh, Mormonism. You start uh, reading about Joseph Smith. You realize that Mormon history is fascinating. Yes. And then this kind of gets you, this lights something inside of you and you start pursuing this. Tell me how that pursuit went. Well, so by this time I've left, uh, decided I'm not going to be um, a professor. So I was originally going to get a PhD in history and go down that route. Um, I instead uh, started working for university presses. And so I was also had a love of publishing and, um, and I was kind of, like you say, an innovator in um uh, postscript map illustration. And so, uh, was one of the earliest people who did essentially, uh, computer map drawing for book illustration. And, uh, and so I started doing that very, you know, professionally and also for museums and things like that. And so that was kind of a different path I was going to go down, which is to say publishing. Um, and, and then once I did that, I was no longer, um, connected uh, to you know, vocationally to this great love of mine, which is to say doing medieval or ancient history. And I also don't live in Europe. And so instead, um, you know, as Mike and I would go around and do road trips, we love to do road trips, um, we would engage with the history that's around where we lived, which is Midwest and everything like that. And so we would go to uh, presidential birthplaces and, and uh, homes and, and, and that kind of a thing. And then we'd go find Mormon history sites too, because those are also part of my family history. Um, I've got enough of my my grandmother and mother in me that I also love stopping by a cemetery <laughs> and just wandering around the cemetery and seeing those kind of things. And and, uh, and so, uh, you know, that so that kind of thing. And so in the course of that, that's what um, 
uh, kind of led me into um, much more engagement. And like I said, I read a bunch of the books. So I, I, at a certain point, I know a fair amount about the topic just by um, not by having done any research, but just by having been exposed to all of the secondary uh, uh, literature. And so then um, uh, what ended up happening was um, we had a couple encounters with, um, well, we had encounters all the time with um, LDS people at visitor centers. Uh, then we ended up having some very nice encounters with uh, some Community of Christ people at Community of Christ visitor centers, and we were very impressed with the um, the books uh, at the at the uh, Temple Bookstore in in Kirtland and also at Nauvoo. And we're like, oh, these guys are really, you know, they're they're really, um, you know, not covering over the history like we normally get. I mean, we have fun when we go to the LDS stuff. We went to a um, the temple uh, uh, visitor center in St. George. And, and, and there was an old lady there who went so far off message, you know, they're supposed to just stay on the message. And so she was just telling us this whole thing about the, the ancient Nephite temple that was there and all, of, you know, all of this stuff that she knew all this stuff about. It's almost like the, uh, uh, the dream mine or something like that. But anyway, so, you know, so she would, so, so we could have fun, you know, going and, and visiting those folks, but it wasn't, you know, actual history, right. As opposed to when we found kind of the community of Christ people. And so we went to, um, I, we also saw pictures of the, the independence temple and it was very little, um, online footprint at the time. Actually, I, I personally have actually have, have, have expanded the temple's footprint, you know, because I, I wrote a bunch of the Wikipedia articles back then and that kind of thing at a certain point. But the um, uh, we went to, I wanted to go see this thing because I also am interested in building and architecture and and it was really neat looking. And so uh, we made a special trip to go there. And we also went there because I knew I mentioned these ancestors of mine, the Winchesters. Um, I knew that uh, uh, after so this is obscure stuff, but okay. In the 1838 Mormon Missouri War, there's a uh, a battle that takes place between an illegal Mor illegal Mormon militia and the Danites and uh, the Missouri State Militia at a place called Crooked River, and one of the um, one of the people who was a casualty of that was the senior most apostle David W. Patton, and they took him back, and he died in my great grandparents' cabin or, you know, great, 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 great grandparents. And so, um, and so I'm like, they know, must know where that was. And so I'd like to go to visit their farm, you know, and that kind of thing. And so I went to the, uh, the temple archives in, in independence and met, uh, Ron Romick, who was the archivist for community of Christ at the time. And he said, Oh yeah, not only do we know, we know where everybody's property was. And he took out a index of property that he'd actually edited and, uh, and, and, and gave me the coordinates and we went and, uh, went and found the farm and that kind of a thing. And so, um, Anyway, so that was another major foray into it. Oh, so anyway, so Ron also then, um, I, I showed him this uh, this 300 page family history book that I'd compiled for um, for my family, my my mother's family reunion. And when he saw that, he's like, you know, I really encourage you to go to the Mormon History Association conference <laughs> this this spring, uh, which is going to take place in Kirtland. You know, which is very close to where you live in Michigan, so you should go there because you you would find out that there's people who would like to talk to you about all these things that you're doing, you know. And so, um, and I was a little dubious because I hadn't enjoyed uh, history conferences uh, that I'd been involved in as a medievalist for whatever reason. And so then, I, but then it, I went to this one and I immediately met all of these people whose books I'd read, so Dan Vogel and. Uh, Levina Fielding Anderson and so on and other people and they were immediately very very welcoming and so that uh, I had a wonderful experience and that just sucked me directly into the Mormon historians community uh, and so then that was a very fast track into the middle of that. Mm -hmm. So um, so you so you're re-engaged and you're uh, it must have been having a lot of fun with this re-engagement and uh, because, uh, like I said, you know, it's such a fascinating history that once you start really getting into it, it's it's it's, it's just a blast. But so so you're you're reengaged. You're you're working with the MHA, or you know, and you're and of course you're going to get involved. And well, let's just talk about okay. You uh, eventually end up joining the Community of Christ, right? Right. So what led to that? Uh, so I went to MHA, and from MHA, I decided to go to JWHA, which is to say the John Whitmer Historical Association, which is Community of Christ equivalent. Um, and uh, as I was going to do that anyway, I also didn't want to just go as a 
um, as a fanboy to all these historians that uh, I'd known. And so I decided I'd go ahead and spend some time doing my own little magic trick, which is to say, do some maps that um, uh, people would find impressive. And so I took that index of property that Ron Romig had put together and I said, okay, I'm just gonna make a giant, um, let's say eight foot wide map of the Mormon County in Missouri, Caldwell County, and I'm gonna show where all the property was. <laughs> and so I um, and so I spent the summer doing that. Uh, and then it went to JWHA. And at a certain point at the JWHA, I just laid this whole thing out on a table and people were like, who's this guy? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so and so at a certain point uh, that that got a lot of attention and um, person who later became a very good friend and mentor, uh, Jan Ships uh, came up and she said, I am Jan Ships and I am the president elect of this organization and I would like you to be on my program committee for next year. And uh, and then Marty Bradley, who was sitting next to her uh, said, well, I'm Marty Bradley, I'm the, gonna be the president of MHA and we want you to come to MHA too. <laughs> you know, so it was very, you know, and again, very, very welcoming. Uh, and so I became um, very close with JWHA very rapidly as a result of that, and um, and also with the whole Mormon historians community. Uh, but also through the kind of the prism of the of John Whitmer more than MHA right from the start. Uh, and uh, John Whitmer I just like better because you get to talk directly to everybody. There's just less people there, and they're all the historians, right? And so um, and so that was really quite nice, and and um, and and that just worked very rapidly. Uh, as you start getting used to and, and, and connected to the Community of Christ historians, um, I also started looking into our LDS history and and I initially didn't really believe them uh, uh, that they had this uh, developed this kind of nuanced, <laughs> you know, not not literalistic, not not um, dependent on disproven false claim, uh, uh, faith claims. Uh, type of religion because I didn't believe that people had religions like that because uh, I was only pretty much used to uh, the one that I'd grown up in and then just in a kind of a very you know rough thumbnail of uh, the religious right which you know in the United States is is more um, uh, in the media than you know the whatever the progressive left in Christianity and so I was not really really aware of any of the rest of that and so over time I I um, started listening to them and believing them about what they were saying. And so fairly quickly, um, also I was getting involved in uh, ex-Mormon online communities. So I was interested in, there's all of these friends of mine who are Jewish, who aren't religious, who are culturally Jewish. And, and I feel like there's some ethnic background that I've got here that I could be sharing with people, even if I'm not involved in this as a religion. And it was just very problematic to do. And so I started realizing a lot of what people, in a lot of cases, a lot of people in the ex-Mormon community are looking for, these guys over here in Community of Christ have exactly that thing, and they're not talking to each other at all. And if I could just even, you know, explain to them, uh, you know, and show them that, it would be um, helpful for everybody. And so that's kind of that was kind of like the kind of entry as I'm starting to get interested in the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so you're you start engaging the community of Christ. You it sounds to me like you start to fall in love with with what the church stands for. And yeah. now, obviously, you're a, a minister in the in, uh, you have a congregation, a very important congregation in the church. Um, what made what did you felt did you feel a calling to go into yeah. ministry at this point? Yeah, so the um, so from those seeds, um, um, I very much started uh, like we I got together with Ron Romink and uh, and Bill Russell, who's uh, the you know great old grand you know history professor of the from Graceland, you know, and so they routinely would drive out to Sunstone, which is the uh, um, open forum for dialogue in the in the, in independent. Uh, Mormonism movement. And so uh, we went out there um, as covert missionaries, <laughs> you know, to, to, you know, explore this idea that I, I that I was like promoting to those guys, that if we started talking to some of these cultural Mormons, these ex Mormons and telling them, you know, a little bit about community of Christ, they might be interested in joining it. And so uh, we had a really great response from that. And we and I started committing to going to Sunstone every year. Um, part one of the um, 
very serious senses of calling um, that I had through that is uh, the as the Mormon Church at the time and even to now, um, you know, was continuously kind of uh, doubling down on on being anti-gay. That that especially had a negative impact on young gay Mormons who, in the state of Utah, uh, commit suicide in a higher rate than anywhere else in the United States. Um, and so, you know, for for me, an immediate sense of calling was for anybody who's in a place where they're committing suicide. One of the one of the things that they uh, that helps prevent that is if you think that there's any alternative, you know, people will grasp onto that. And so, just being aware um, that they're, you, you know. Um, your entire, in a, yes, it's your entire ethnic identity. It's also your family, familial friend, uh, social identity. And on top of it all, it's your entire cosmological and theological identity, which is, is, is hit at that moment, which is one of the reasons why that effect happens. If that last layer can be pulled away and you can say, no, wait, it's not also God, because there's another, there's another alternative within the restoration that is not saying that, um, that that all by itself, um, is, meaningful and and there's been a bunch of people for whom that has been meaningful and who, you know who've shared that with me in the past decades as you know that 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 was a a moment that helped them not have go down that path you know so so in essence you're playing a pastoral role and and you know i think that's very touching because yeah you would have a heart for these kids and yeah. what they're going through and so um you know to the least of these right um, that's a Christ-like attribute, you know, where you want to help, help those who are on, on the fringes and, you know, and so that's a, so that's a, that's a very spiritual thing that you were doing, you know, on a, yeah. and, and, and so at this point, when you started doing this, this reach out, when you're doing the reverse missionary thing, were you already a minister in the community of Christ? No. Or, okay. So, what, so was I was this? not a member. Um, and so at a certain point, um, uh, so we had our, 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 our um, our, our base camp was always at uh, Levina Fielding Anderson's house. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I'm with the Community of Christ delegation to Sunstone and we're hanging out, we're doing our debrief. Uh, Levine is not, she was, um, you know, she's one of the, you know, um, intellectual Mormons who was excommunicated in, uh, in the 1990s um, for just pu publishing history, honestly. Um, but she is, uh, she was one who absolutely committed to her um, faith tradition and continued to be active in her ward as an excommunicated um, uh, lady who would play the uh, piano for them and 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 wasn't allowed to take the sacrament right uh, anyway so it wasn't she was only being open and nice in other words it wasn't a plot or something like that but she would host us and so I was sitting there at uh, a certain point with um, a bunch of people around the table and including uh, Susan Oxley, who is the uh, one of the apostles who was um, at the there at that time. And and uh, yeah, Levina asked, she says, after we had this whole discussion, she said, well, John, would you ever think of joining Community of Christ? And, and I said, absolutely, yes. Uh, and, uh, and and Susan turned to me and she said, you would, <laughs> you know, and so and so uh, and so later, um, Later, when I did join, uh, uh, Susan actually performed the confirmation, which was really nice. Wow, wow! And then, uh, does this for you to get your ministerial credentials in the Community of Christ? Did you need to attend like the seminary at Graceland, or or how does that work? No. Um, so that we we have a lay priesthood, just like um, the rest of the re Restoration tradition, uh, and so we have the same priesthood structure. Um, that exists more or less in the LDS church. The difference, there's differences. The first presidency is not simply a, uh, a group of, of three additional apostles. It's a different quorum and so on and so forth. There's, but in generally what, what happens is uh, um, I, I uh, joined the church, was baptized and confirmed on April 6, 2010. And then um, I at that point was moving here. And so I, um, I got baptized in Independence, Missouri, but immediately transferred my, uh, my membership to Toronto. So this has been my, my congregation and it's going to be my lifelong congregation. Um, and then in Toronto, um, callings to uh, priesthood up through elder are largely um, discerned at the 
at the congregational level. And so what's going to happen is that if people uh, are providing different kinds of ministry, you were, you were like identifying things that you consider to be uh, a sign of a Christ-like calling or something like that. So as people are discerning that, as they are sensing um, that, as they pray about that, um, they will uh, tell the pastor, you know, about that and then, um, and write that down in some cases. And um, the pastor then will pray about that and think about that and discern about that. Um, and if there's a sense that there's a calling, the pastor then sends that on to the mission center president, which is to say the, the Canadian level, and then the Canadian level sends it on to the first presidency. And then the calling comes back down. And so then, and then if you're called and like I was to be an elder, um, then there's three temple school courses that you have to take in addition to a, um, a ministry with children uh, certification. And so there's a, there's rules about, you know, being able to safely uh, deal with children and, and make sure the children are safe. Uh, and so that's a, a certification that happens. And then we take three temple school courses, which are uh, introduction to servanthood ministry, introduction to scripture, and, uh, and ministry, and in my case, ministry of the elder, since it was the elder course. Uh, and so in the, um, you know, and so in the case of the, of the scripture one, I'd already done my own um, study of scripture that I think was, you know, more significant than, <laughs> than what you have to take to get to do that. But anyway, that's fine. Um, but, and so that's kind of, and then, and so then that takes about, I don't know, six months or a year, and then, and then you're ordained. And so then because of the, um, the kind of state of the congregation. So this is a, a old congregation, but had been a very much a graying congregation. Um, uh, and uh, there was a place where a lot of the elders and high priests who were in the congregation didn't feel, um, for example, like they wanted to baptize anybody by immersion because it's a, they were a little old to be picking people back up. And so, um, and so actually I, uh, I got ordained to be an elder. And then the next Saturday, I baptized two people that had been kind of waiting for baptisms and the, and the next Sunday I was uh, ordained to be the pastor of the congregation. Oh, so interesting. Interesting. Well, that's a fascinating. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of, all oh, of course, yeah, you are, you're a lay led ministry and that's kind of what is the basis of the restoration. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of cool how that all kind of fell into place for you. Um, and, and I do want to get it at some point, maybe at the close of this, I kind of want to get in into how you ended up in Canada <laughs> as well, because sure. I find that to be an interesting story. But I think really at this point, um, you know, one of the things that's happening within evangelicalism and, uh, and within the restoration as well is that a lot of young people are leaving the faith. You know, there are, many of them are taught a very, uh, now I want you to understand, I'm coming from an evangelical background and I'm definitely to yeah. the right, right of you. I, I'm probably to the left of a lot of evangelicals, but I'm to the right of you in some ways, theologically and politically probably. But um, this is a crisis, if you will, on some level that's happening where these young people are taught a very literal um, uh, view of uh, the Bible, of the scriptures, uh, very conservative theology, and and then maybe often are taught maybe like the earth being very young, you know, maybe only 6,000 years old. And so they get away to school and then, or they encounter the internet, really. I mean, <laughs> before they get out of the house, they're on the internet and they, and they encounter all these other, this counter narrative that seems to be pretty overwhelming to them. And often what happens is these kids, uh, realize like, oh, this is just all nonsense and none of it's true and it's fairy tales and they just walk away. And that's a great tragedy because some of these people are the best and brightest and we want them in our churches, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but they're leaving. And so what I really like about you and one thing that's really touched me uh, listening to you throughout the years on Mormon stories and gospel tangents is that, uh, first of all, I, I picked up, you have a pastoral heart, but also you have a, a nuanced metaphorical way of dealing with scripture. In right. other words, it's still scripture to you, right? but it's less literal. Um, it's less legalistic, but it's more about grace and love and metaphor and nuance. Tell me a little bit about that approach. Sure. Well, I mean, even going back to uh, my teenage study of scripture, um, I think one of the problems that people have when they are, are reading scripture is if it's a literal history is on the one hand, they're not historians. 
and they're not really actually informed by um, the academic discipline of history, the academic discipline of literary criticism, and what, frankly, uh, uh, 300 or whatever number of years, uh, as those have developed, those have developed largely or initially largely to study the Bible. And, um, and by the way, in a very, with, by Christians in a very earnest, <laughs> you know, way, in other words, they wanted to, um, uh, this is the most important text to them. And they wanted to apply uh, science, which is to say knowledge, you know, which is our God, you know, God given ideas, you know, our, our, our um, intellect and our ability to reason is the component, uh, uh, one of the major components of which if we're created in God's image, that that is where we are reflecting um, uh, what God is in doing. And so therefore not to, uh, to tear down and not to attack, but rather to more fully understand um, uh, these texts that are so valuable. And unfortunately, um, um, even though those, uh, let's say, let's say those studies are fairly well established, um, it hasn't percolated through to, to um, uh, the masses very well. And people actually, I would say, um, church leaders have done a, a relatively poor job uh, understanding it. And I think that in part that was because people, um, in, when we got to the enlightenment, so 300 and some years ago, I think people went down a kind of an intellectual dead end that has, has led to a place where um, people are raised in the church with um, with faith claims and faith traditions that are that are brittle, and then, like you say, can be shattered by exposure to um, information, which is not, you know, which is valid information. And so this is a problem. So so the problem, um, I would say, for for churches is, you know, the don't build your house on the sand of. Uh, of your kind of vernacular understanding of history when you're not a historian and, and all those kind of things, because when the storm comes, it, your house is going to get washed away. You know, you want to build your house uh, on the old rock, you know, which is to say on on God and our connection there. Uh, on, you know, there too, <laughs> and so uh, and so and and then and it'll be solid, and you're not going to have that that same, those same kind of issues, and so. Um, so how do you how do you how do you view things in a more nuanced way? This is actually the 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 more traditional Christian way to understand scripture. So what's scripture for? Is scripture just a history book and um, and it's telling us history lessons? I, I it's I would say no. So we're not going to read even the if we were to be exposed to the the most amazing and and historically accurate uh, uh, narration of the history of the Hittite Empire. That doesn't suddenly become scripture to us because that's has not that's not relevant, you know, in that sense because it's history and history is not scripture and scripture is not history. Rather, um, I think people have always understood that the I think that the top goal of scripture is to point us to God and to um, better connect us to God, and then it has uh, gradations of what the understandings are underneath that. So what moral lessons are we learning from reading about you know about this text what are um what are analogies that we can be drawing from these narratives so that we can uh, either see how maybe we should be living life in our own times which is not about um in large part anyway not about being a shepherd or, or a fisherman or something like that but we're living in a very different time period when we have other kinds of issues but we can maybe by analogy um think about th these kind of things and so so what i would say that the the value of scripture is in a sense it's like um the value that uh socrates and plato had in the way they did philosophy which is they didn't want to just give you a set of answers uh, they instead wanted to engage you in thinking and dialogue because as you are are thinking about that and as you are understanding it for your own time and and that then it's something living it's living as we would say in the spirit as opposed to just being dead text. Hmm. So yeah, and I think that that's you know I just want all of the viewers to understand something you know if you if you take the Bible literally and and, and believe in the historicity of the scriptures of the Book of Mormon the Bible. Uh, this is not, uh, this is, John is not necessarily attacking your worldview. He's just kind of giving an explanation 
of like, look, if you're going to believe that way, that's fine, right? But yeah. if there are people who um, that just doesn't work for them anymore. And you know, as Christians, as believers, as members of this body, um, what are we going to do for that, that, that one, um, that, that one that th does stray from the flock? And uh, do we just have the flock mentality and stick with the group? Or do we go out and get that other one and say, listen, you have a home here. Right. That if, if you don't understand or you don't see the world through the same prism that I do, that's fine. That if, 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 if metaphor, if poetry, if beauty, these things can also lead you to God as well. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the, if you will, kind of the dead letter of sometimes of, of the legalistic aspects of the Bible that gets you there. Yeah. But it can, it, it, can, it can be done through different aspects, but you're still part of this flock. And I think that's what's so important is what you're doing is that it can tell these people. And, and, and if, if you're a parent and you're concerned about your child and they've encountered all these things, what a beautiful way that you could re-engage them. Yeah. Say, son, daughter, you know what? We love you. And if you view scripture differently, there's still beauty in here. And there's something inspirational in here that can give you a connection to the divine, whether you believe it literally or not. And uh, just comment on that. Well, and so what I would say is that it, it, the, the one thing that is helpful if you're going to try to make that um, that connection is you also have to have a little bit of self-transformation. You don't have to change what your beliefs are, but but you also need to inhabit a slightly different value space. In other words, where you are accepting that what's valuable here is that scripture um, is pointing you to God, that it, it is informing um Again, your principles, it's, a, it's informing, you know, like how right living and it isn't only just a history book to you. So you, I'm not saying you have to reject it as a history book, but you almost have to kind of not focus on that if you're going to be able, I think, to make um, to make that connection in an, in an actual, you know, way that was going to work for for those people who are, for, for whom they are actually now being informed by those kind of academic disciplines. Not you don't have to be informed by those in order to live a meaningful life. But when people are, that's going to preclude, uh, like you're saying, a kind of the the literalistic uh, way of looking at it. This is an issue that was known to Christians the entire time. So in the uh, fourth century, uh, Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, who's one of the most brilliant Christians of all time, through whom almost the entire uh, Western tradition gets. Uh, mentally focused as this guy um, consolidates classical learning and and puts it forward in terms of how people understand that in Christianity afterwards. And Augustine says, you know, very clearly on this kind of thing, you know, yes, scripture is absolutely the center of all of what we're doing. But if you're reading of scripture, um, if you're reading of scripture, and when you're not a physicist, <laughs> Uh, so utterly contradicts what even the pagans know about physics that that they that they then point at you and say you Christians are ignorant. Then you are um, unfortunately uh, one blaspheming against God, but two you are uh, are are denying. You know you're actually you know uh, preventing uh, evangelical work from happening <laughs> because you are you are precluding people who frankly know better about that subject than you. Just because you've read text in your own way and so don't interpret text that way he says you know and so he doesn't say i mean he doesn't say physicist he's talking about natural philosophy back then which is the ancient way of saying science but it's specifically we know what he's talking about which is to say the natural world the, the physical world so. you know I, I you know i come from a very conservative background i was taught a young earth creationism and things like that and um and, and so that's the world i grew up in and i just found it so fascinating that like um if you look at, you, you may have never even heard of him, but his name's Ken Ham, and he has the Creation Museum, the Ark yeah. Encounter in Kentucky. And he cites these studies of saying the, the kids are leaving the churches because they're exposed, the, the, they're being exposed to evolution and, and they're, they're shown that creationism isn't true. So his, his solution is we got to double down. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, uh, I don't know if that's going to work quite frankly, doubling down on that, saying, well, we've got to right. be more literal. We've got to teach them even more of this because as these kids get into the real world, they encounter so, uh, cognitive dissonance very quickly. 
And I just think like, see, there's no room for nuance in that world and uh, in metaphor. And it just, it, I just, I think that that aspect of Christianity, while it's still very powerful and very strong, um, th there will be a reckoning at some point because you just can't keep on doubling down on stuff like that. Well, that's also very, very modern. So all of those ideas are, are, are entirely modern. So when I'm talking about Augustine and all the way down yeah. through, through Anselm and everybody all through the, the center of the Middle Ages and even, even the Renaissance, when we say, we sometimes have to say, we, you've probably heard of, we say secular humanism. And the reason why they've had to put the word secular in front of it is because humanism is naturally Christian. <laughs> there was this part of it, or there was or it developed out of Christianity. And so all of these folks, you know, including, you know, or Newton and Galileo, these are these are fervent Christians. And so there there's are not uh, it isn't precluded. It is a modern phenomenon where um, where science, which is frankly something that has evolved out of Christianity, the reason why uh, scientific language is Latin, and that's also the language of the medieval Christian church and the modern Catholic Church is because it comes out of the same thing. The reason why the universities, the universities and 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 uh, the reasons why when you graduate that you put on medieval clerical robes, you actually put the hat on of a medieval cleric and all of these clergy robes. And you know, that's what now I thought of as a graduation robe. The reason why that happens is because the entire invention of the university system and academics comes out of the medieval cathedral schools. You know, and so those are where all clerks or clerics, or in other words, that was what, that was what all religion was. So science is ultimately um, a component of religion and specifically Judeo Christianity. But there has unfortunately been in the, like I say, since the Enlightenment, there has been a, um, uh, I think, unfortunately, a, a, a what ended up proving to be it was a, it was earnestly followed, but it ends up proving to be an intellectual dead end. Uh, that that isn't helpful to continue to go down because unfortunately it leads to um, some these brittle faith encounters and like you say a pult ultimately a reckoning. Um, uh, it, it's going to be very fine for a person's um, you know life and can live a very meaningful life, but as that you're going to continue to have these kind of disconnects. Yeah, yeah, and and so what? Just I'm curious, just on a theological level, um, how? Who who is God to you? What 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 does God represent? Uh, yeah. Tell tell me about what God looks like to you. Well, so um, traditionally in the West and Christianity, um, we view God through the prism of the Trinity, and so therefore we have a multiple ways of viewing God. Um, a lot of times when we talk about God. You know, modern times or more, most recently, um, we're specifically usually talking about the creator as opposed to God, the spirit or, or God, Jesus Christ. Although you can in, think of it in either one of those ways, or that can be a focus in Christianity. Um, and so in terms of uh, God, the creator, um, uh, what we have, for example, in uh, the Bible, in the gospel of John, for example, we have this idea that nobody has ever seen uh, God, the creator. We have a, a, a sense from um, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, that uh, God is not to be pictured. God is not to be, um, the name isn't supposed to be spoken, you know, the, in this sort of thing. Um, and so the idea of it is, is that we're, we're, we're talking about uh, a being itself. Um, and so the whole, um, so the creator, so why everything uh, that exists, exists. Um, generally speaking, uh, uh, there's different ways that we can look at this theologically. And so one of the ways that's most common um, is called apathetic, which is to say where we don't say, uh, we can say what God isn't, <laughs> you know? And so we say God is not mortal. God is not corporeal. God is not, you know, they're not physical. Uh, uh, God, uh, you know, not petty, all these kind of things. And so then, and so then, and so then we also traditionally, I think, and I do personally equate God with, uh, goodness for goodness own sake, uh, love for love's own sake, wisdom for wisdom's sake, uh, wisdom for the sake of wanting everything, to, you know, wanting to everybody to uh, get more into that image of God where, uh, where there's not needless suffering and all the kinds of things that happen through uh, various kinds of selfishness and foolishness and that kind of thing. And so um, I think that when we, for me, um, when 
I'm feeling um, most, let's say, in tuned with God is when, um, especially um, love, especially in the terms of love of community and love of humanity, when we are are really feeling that, and when we are really feeling like that's our central purpose, then suddenly we are, I think, participating in what God actually is, which is love, as we actually also hear a lot in the scriptures too. Um, so God, the creator, but it's un, but God, that God is in, in a sense also, well, beyond our grasp. So, you know, again, be, uh, immortal and, and infinite. So those are another couple of apathetic things you can say. So in other words, not finite, not mortal, um, you know, beyond our grasp and our ability to, um, really comprehend or even let's say have a very personal relationship with uh, God the Creator and that's been one of the uh, the whole reasons why Christians view God through these other um, traditional prisms and so when people um, have traditionally understood Christ as God one of the ideas is um, that you you never can experience uh, God the Creator in God's own self according to scripture and the traditional understanding. And instead you are experiencing the Lord or the glory uh, or the effects. So as we see God's love, as we see experience being, in other words, as we're experiencing those results and the innovation for, for Paul and other early Christians is that you must declare that Christ is Lord, right? And so now that we understand um, a, 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 we have a, a way that we visualize um Lord and God affects in that way. And then we have this third um, understanding, you know, which is to say also the spirit. And so as we are feeling, um, let's say the effects of the spirit, however, we're going to try to identify those in a responsible way. And so if I go back to Augustine, um, Augustine said the moment when you have the spirit is when, um, when you've been pondering a problem, and it's and some, suddenly you know like it's all the pieces are too complicated and it all looks like uh, an Einstein chalkboard that you cannot uh, you know you can't get your hands around it and then suddenly you have this moment where you say Eureka and and it all fits together and suddenly uh, you really understand that then that's the moment that he says that you've really felt uh, what the spirit is acting on you and so that's his idea so there's multiple ways of of how we can understand uh, that and so I'm not saying that I um, the way I'm talking about it is is the way everybody has to, but this is how I'm approaching uh, my own relationship with God in these three traditional um, uh, avenues that we have available to us in Christianity. So you could almost say that a moment of clarity is an encounter with the divine. Absolutely. The divine as the spirit, especially. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, so in one sense, God, the creator, is unapproachable um, in, in, in the context of you're telling me. I, I would like for you to tell me, um, who is Jesus to you? What does he represent? So um, there's a couple different ways we could look at Jesus for me. Um, so Jesus is, uh, in the form of Christ, is the second person then of the Trinity, which is to say another way that we understand God. And there's all kinds of different ways that... Um, we traditionally understand um, and are experiencing Christ. And so one of the, um, the ways that we do in Christianity is that we all actually become Christ's body in the world, right? And so, and so sometimes the church is called, you know, like the body of Christ. And then sometimes um, also, and again, I think misunderstood, even, even transubstantiation is misunderstood because it's not transmutation or trans physicalization, even if some Catholics even think of this, but it's actually transubstantiation, which is um, a uh, an ancient philosophical term for um, having something change what its purpose is for. And so its purpose is for us to be connected in community and to God and to share in God's purpose. And so the purpose change is not the physical matter. And so if you're going to go and look at it in, under a microscope, that's not going to get you anywhere. Um, and so, and so, in that sense, I think that for me, the vital part of of understanding, or you know, of having Christ be connected to Christ, is um, 
being part of Christ's body, so the community, so being part of community that is setting itself apart for, um, for higher purposes, to try to achieve good in the world, to try to bring about um, uh, God's heavenly commonwealth on earth uh, so that we can both minimize and then ultimately end needless suffering. Um, but I would separate that. And then another place that we also have then for Christ is the Jesus Christs of scripture who are part of the lived tradition of the church. And so scripture um, forms a vital part of how we live as Christians and how we worship together. And so it informs our hymns, it informs sermons, we read, we read lectionary scriptures and that kind of a thing. And so those are very frequently um, encounters with uh, the Jesus Christ of scripture, which can be approached, and you can also approach it individually by reading. Uh, and so that is a, a traditional encounter that we have as a church with another kind of Jesus Christ, as opposed to the theological Christ. And then finally, there was the historical figure of Jesus, who I also think is, is separate from these other ideas. The historical Jesus ultimately um, informed a lot of the um, what became the, the scriptural Jesus Christ and, um, and people's experiences with in early Christianity and experiences with the risen Christ visionarily um, also informed uh, our de of developing I I the idea of the theological Christ. Um, but the historical Jesus is not essential to either of those. The historical Jesus is a construct now, and it is someone who existed in the past, but we can't access because you can't, the past is gone. And, and so now the historical Jesus is a construct of academic historians. And so what we, we have that's vital to us as Christians are um, the lived uh, uh, scripture, Jesus of scripture, Jesus Christ of scripture, and the um, experience or our understanding of God through the theological Christ. And then the, um, the historical Jesus is something that can be fun for us to learn about as we are, are better informing our understanding of the past, but is not, um, again, his, uh, church is not a history class. <laughs> And it's not, and if everybody, if everybody, if that was what uh, this religion should be about, we should all become historians, but that's not what we do because that's not what it's, that, that's not what it's about. So what does a metaphorical resurrection of Jesus Christ look like? Yeah. So there's a bunch of different ways that it can look. <laughs> so, um, so for one thing, the idea of resurrection and renewal is one of the most central components of just all of like what humanity is about. And so um, we have our life cycles. So the cycles, we, we, we don't, we're, we're more detached from this than we ever have been in all of human history. But, but the reality is that um, people, we'd still experience things like day and night, you know, every day. So we have those basic cycles. If we live in the Northern hemisphere like this, we experience seasons. Um, you know, it's all way less um, relevant to our lives than it ever was when every when 99% of us were all agricultural workers and that kind of a thing, when it when we were very much tied to that. And so we have those those basic cycles. And so those are um, uh, day comes again after night, uh, waking comes again after sleeping, um, light and summer and harvest come again after death and winter and and fasting. And so those are all happening on a on our our a, a less than um, human lifetime cycles. Then you have the cycle of generations. And so you at one point or other were the kid, and now you're the age you are. Maybe you're going to be an adult and a parent. I'm now the age where I, if I'd had kids, which I did not, I would be a grandparent, and so on. And so and so you are experiencing again that 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 cycle where you are are are. On the one hand, you're always you, and I have this beautiful medieval diagram of the life cycle where you are at every place in it, and so and and where you're at the top of the wheel, and and then as you're declining, and as you're you know aging, 
and God is at the very center of it and God is connected to you at every single moment. And so it's all you, but you don't experience it that way because we're temporal. And so in other words, we're experiencing it at, at the moment of the, of the now, as opposed to uh, God's eternal presence where God is beyond time, right? And so, and so then beyond then your own life, you're also tied into your congregation's life. And so I've mentioned my congregation as it goes all the way back, you know, to uh, the 1830s. Um, and so I'm part of something that will extend far beyond me, um, you know, especially if I do my job right, <laughs> you know, and so, and so in other words, that I, so that I've inherited uh, from people who went before me and, and this will go on beyond me. And so part of, um, what lives on is, as I say, the more my purpose is tied to the eternal, the more what I am doing is really committing to love for love's own sake, the more that I'm actually um, just experiencing and uh, participating in the good, which is God, the more that's what is going to continue on. And I don't care. And ultimately, it doesn't matter if I carve a granite slab that says John Hammer and put some dates on it or something like that. That doesn't matter if that lives on because I don't care about that because what I care about is that eternal thing. And so then uh, in that sense, um, resurrection is part of those cycles where they go on. You are, you are eternally a part of um, what continues on when you're, you know, which is continuing on temporally here on earth, but nevertheless, you're always a part of because you're connected to uh, the divine, which is beyond time for all eternity. Um, and so I guess that's how I would look at it, or that's how I kind of um, look at it. I don't look at it in terms of, um, I don't know, you know, this thing where suddenly we're, I don't know, we're all going to um, have our bodies back as of 22nd year olds and we're going to um, live in a very white cloudy looking space and what are we doing for for the rest of eternity <laughs> I don't know in other words because so, I, I feel like it doesn't um, it that's never very well thought out uh, uh, what afterlife is going to be um, what I think instead uh, we should think of afterlife or um, immortality as you know putting off the mortal is something that is so outside of our understanding you know it's outside of our experience it's like us trying to grasp what God is. And so rather than really spend a bunch of time worrying about that, I prefer to um, try to connect with the eternal here and now as we're, as we're living here and now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like uh, within your faith tradition, you have the concept of Zion, yes. you know, bringing Zion here. And it's a, uh, it used to, many uh, still believe it to be a literal, but also has a metaphorical idea and within Christianity, that would kind of be like the idea of the millennium. In other words, uh, well, we, we see the, the emblem behind you. You know, that's a foreshadowing yeah. of, the, right. of the millennium. Um, the peaceable kingdom, the idea right. of uh, bringing heaven here on earth. Uh, as, and, and that your, your view of what you're trying to do is being part of this eternal cycle but as we, uh, like Martin Luther King said, I believe the arc of the universe bends towards justice, right? And so the idea is, is that um, this bringing of Zion or the millennium or this, this the bringing in a new age, a new earth, if you will, bringing heaven down here on earth, is that kind of like, would that be a good analogy of what you're kind of trying to do? Absolutely. And I would say that this is a great example of metaphor, <laughs> you know, which is to say, it doesn't make a lot of sense if we were to just say, I don't know, lions are running around, you know, like in some kind of a, uh, you know, if it was some kind of literally the case where lions are running around with lambs and whatever, whatever the universe is supposed to look like under those circumstances, but rather it's a, it's a visionary metaphor for, um, for uh, justice so that the people who are weak and marginalized are not being um, abused and uh, by the powerful, right? So the, the lions of the earth in Isaiah's day. And so, um, and so, yeah, and so what I, what I'd like to look at it as, um, uh, like with a, like a limit. So as you, as you are seeing like improvement or something like that, if you were thinking progress in history, there's like a graph and it goes like this, right? And so, and it never approaches infinity because you're never going to get to infinity, but it might, but it, it starts doing this thing where it approaches infinity. And so, um, you know, I would love if we could get to a place where, um, 
uh, you know, like life on earth was more like Star Trek, the next generation, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just to say, there's a lot more justice for everybody because nobody has a, having to face like things like poverty and, and lack of, of stuff because they have replicators or whatever. Right. And so no, so whether or not that's going to be the solution, I'm not saying it is, but in other words, if we could get to a place where we are building, um, something that's more and more and more and more just. And so we definitely, and how do we get it? It's not just by sitting around dreaming of it, but we have to act, right? And so one of the ways, um, you know, we have a fairly small congregation here in Toronto, but one of the ways that we've been working on that is through um, supporting and creating uh, social housing charities. And so uh, for the past, I guess, 50 years, the uh, our social housing charity um, has had, you know, multiple apartment buildings where we've housed uh, a couple hundred people who, um, you know, might otherwise uh, fall through the cracks and be, can be part of, um, you know, this thing that we have in all cities, which is to say this problem of homelessness, which is uh, housing injustice, because often it's people with mental health conditions and who are, who are falling through the cracks, but um, don't need to be in a lot of cases. So. You know, I, was, I talked to some of my right wing friends and I'm trying to reach out to them to say, you know, we're all image bearers. And I said, you know, uh, a Black Lives Matter activist knows pre precisely that we live in a fallen world and they're fighting up, they're pushing up against that. You may disagree with their tactics, they yeah. innately recognize we live in a fallen world and that it's an unjust world. Yeah. And uh, to me, that's very Christian. And, all, and so don't be afraid of that, folks. But the other thing, too, is, you know, like a lot of atheists like to say, well, there's no Christians in Star Trek. They miss the whole point. The Star <laughs> Trek universe is thoroughly Christian. Right. In the context, yeah. the entire Christian worldview is adopted. There's equality. There's no Jew. There's no Gentile. And, right. and, and, and that it's, a, it's actually a very Christian world that exists because it's built on the foundation and there's even a Star Trek episode that deals with uh, Jesus Christ in one of their episodes in the original series. Yeah. Um, the point being is that atheists miss the whole point. That's a Christian world. And I think no. that the atheist worldview looks more like the Borg. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know I, I don't know if I go with that. But oh, what okay. I would say is that, um, I, what I'd say is that, uh, I don't know. So, so I, a lot of cases, atheists have not been exposed to, um, a, a more nuanced understanding of what Christianity can be. So in other words, I think that they have been uh, the, like where I was at when I first encountered community of Christ people, which is I only had the experience with the uh, the church of my childhood, which I understood through my own, uh, however, eminently logical childish um, experience that was also narrow, narrowly defined by my personal provincial perspective. And so I um, hadn't had all of this um, much more vast exposure that I've had now that um, I'm able to be on uh, interfaith councils and, and the Canadian Council of Churches. And so now that I've actually gone to uh, the Sikh Gurdwara and met with Sikh leaders, now that I've spent a bunch of time uh, with leaders of the Reform Synagogues here, uh, with the Affirming Mosque, with the um, uh, Canadian-based Zoroastrians who are, um, who are making uh, strive, striving towards uh, uh, eliminating uh, gender um, inequality and ordination among a again three thousand year old religion that you know that you know that it has has been kind of uh, sexist for a, at least the last thousand years pretty you know in that way you know and so um, anyway so now now that I have been exposed to all of these different experiences I, I, I I'm able to understand better. Uh, you know, whereas if you just are exposed to a caricature and 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 you accept the caricature as the only way it is, that's why they that's why they say that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's must be so fascinating for you to be on this continuing uh, journey and you're encountering these other faith traditions and finding commonality. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, like I would say is, uh, you know, Jesus Christ did turn the world upside down. Our calendar is based on it. Every single religion has had to make an accommodation for Jesus. So this is not even a condemnation of other faith traditions. Uh, you've you grappled with Jesus too. You know, I mean, you can go to India and there's Hindu shrines that have images of Jesus. You go to sure. Japan and there's this village of people that say, you know, I'm related to Jesus, right? I mean, it's every he permeates the 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 sphere, you know. And so it's not an exclusive exclusivity thing that I'm talking about. I'm thinking that it also there's the universal nature to Jesus. 
uh, as well. And what he represents, who do you say what I am, right? Who do you say that I am? Um, and it's just kind of an interesting uh, worldview. And I love your perspective on this. I think it's important that we have these conversations because I think so often we have these dividing lines. And, you know, I think like the, the great tragedy of how the church treated uh, gay and lesbian and transgendered people, the history of that is just yep. is an awful sin. And, uh, you know, we need to come to repentance for that because we all are image bearers. And, uh, you know, and on some level, love is love. And I understand that concept. And I think that that's important that Christians uh, need to listen to the other and learn from them and not just be ready to jump on them and hit them over the head with the Bible, but just have a genuine, loving, Christ-like conversation. And I think that's what you're doing, John. And well, I, I want to honor that. I want to honor you and everything that you're doing. And I want to say that throughout the years of watching you, I think on some level, you've been ministering to me as well. So that heart of a pastor has been there all along. And I wanted to thank you so much for that. One last thing, a couple things. First of all, sure. Uh, my good, I got to get you together with Christopher Thomas. He wrote the, a Pentecostal reads the Book of Mormon. Um, okay. he, he lectures at BYU. Um, he's, he's made a lot of inroads in, in, in that community and uh, good friends with Sandra Tanner and uh, him and I, we, we were just on a, our Zoom last night. We talked to each other about once a week and talk about Mormonism for two or three hours. So because we, we just both love it. But he commented, he said, oh, uh, John Haber. He said, oh, I love that hair of his. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was a, he was a Pentecostal, but he was in a rock and roll band in the 70s. So he loved yeah. that, that hairstyle. So I told my mom, I said, yeah, see, yeah you gotta, I want you to see every once in a while, I'll get, I pull my mom into it. You know, and I'd, I'd say, you got to watch um, some, some of these people like John DeLynn and Rick Bennett. And then say, now this is John Hamer and he's a rock star in the community <laughs> of Christ. And of course, in her mind, she's thinking rock star, like evangelical. She's thinking of somebody on TBN or a televangelist. And then here you come on, you're kind of bookish and you're wearing the glasses. And I said, but he's a rock star because of his teaching and, and, and how revolutionary he is within his movement. She's like, oh, okay. So her idea of a televangelist yeah. versus you was different. <laughs> Um, but so you got to meet Christopher, you got awesome hair. And then this is the final thing. I think one thing that really gave me respect for you, I believe in people who uh, are people of principle, even if I don't agree with them, you, st you know, you stand up for what you believe in and you practice what you preach. And so here we are in the mid 2000s and George W. Bush is up for reelection. <laughs> and I'll have you know that I'm riding around in my car with my Bush Cheney bumper stickers on my car. And at this time, there are many, many people saying, if George W. Bush gets reelected, I'm moving out of the country. Yeah. And uh, by golly, you were one of them. You said it. <laughs> you, you said it and you did it. Props to you, man. <laughs> yeah, I was, um, I really, so I'm a, I have a history background and all this kind of thing. And I, um, I was just simply not convinced that this Iraq invasion was going to have any positive consequences for anybody. And um, I thought it was going to be, very destabilizing and and have negative consequences. So I was I was quite opposed to that, and so that was something that I was uh, I you know was uh, didn't want to be anyway. And so I so we we looked around. We had the ability to um, to live anywhere, and um, one of the things that was really important to me. So I grew up in just a wonderful, privileged, uh, lily white suburb of Minneapolis, and. Um, and just never experienced anything in the way of uh, diversity in terms of background and thought and, and all those kind of things, frankly. And so um, we wanted to move to some place that where we would have that experience. And so um, downtown Toronto is uh, one of the most diverse places on the planet. Um, there were all kinds of reasons why, like you say, um, politically, but also uh, culturally that were, that were very appealing. So I wanted to also kind of escape from car culture. I wanted to have a place where um, I would be, you know, not drive to the gym and get on a treadmill, but rather walk to my grocery store, you know, and that kind of thing. And so um, the ability to live in an eminently walkable city, um, and we live two blocks from the subway station, um, live in again, the most diverse city in the world. And my, my particular census tract in, in Canada is, I think, the most diverse. And so um, uh, the number of friends that I'm able to have from all of these backgrounds, and I mean, when I mentioned um, 
I don't know, being able to go spend time in the Sikh Gurdwara. This is a, it, it's, it, the, the population here is like that. And it's, and it's been a, a, a blessing to me because I'm of the view that if you're only exposed to people that are like you and who think like you, then it's very difficult for you to ever uh, be challenged and to ever learn. And so um, I've been unendingly uh, blessed by having um, my neighbors not have just a default Christian or back, you know, or post-Christian background, but to to frankly be coming at this from so many different backgrounds that it has caused me to um, think how do I how do I reach out and share principles that I think are valuable to somebody who's grown up post-Muslim, post-Hindu, not not uh, just post-Christian. And so it's been an amazing experience and I couldn't be happier that we moved here. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Now, I imagine there's another scenario if you rewound the tape that I think the best analogy is, is John Hamer would be the cosmopolitan member of the GTA and I would probably be a prairie populist in Alberta. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think that kind of gives us a little perspective, but um, it, it, uh, I, I've had fun here, uh, John. This has been a real privilege to have this conversation with you. And I just want to remind all my viewers to uh, like and subscribe and hit the notification button. And uh, also, I'm going to leave a link uh, in the description to uh, the website for your church. And so if people want to explore your ministry and what you stand for, uh, and just kind of maybe... Maybe they don't agree with you, but, you know, at least watch a few videos, just kind of see where he's coming from. Perhaps this is an, a good introduction to John and his perspective um, and his in his worldview and, and a different stream of Christianity that you might be normally unaccustomed to. But maybe it's a stream you might want to take a dip in and check out. So I want to thank everyone. I want to thank John once again for coming on. Everybody, you have yourself a blessed day and be well. Thank you, Stephen.